This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. We'll see that the Northern Irish zealots, Colombian cartels, European tyrants, Liberian rebels, Greek oligarchs, Chicago gangs, Indian mobs, Rwandan genocidaires, a new word I learned, thank you to you. <laughs> Those are people who administer genocide. English soccer hooligans and American invaders. So first, let me ask, what is war? In saying that war is a prolonged violent struggle between groups, what do the words prolonged groups and violent mean? I sit at the sort of intersection of economics and political science, and I, I also dwell a little bit in psychology, but that's partly because I'm married to a psychologist, sometimes do research with her. All these things are really different. So if you're a political scientist, you spend a lot of time just classifying a really narrow kind of conflict and studying that. And that's, that's an important way to make progress uh, as a social scientist. But I'm not trying to make progress. I'm trying to sort of help everybody step back and say, you know what, there's like some common things that we know from these disciplines that uh, relate to a really wide range of phenomena. Basically, we, we can talk about them in a very similar way and we can get really similar insights. So I wanted to actually bring them together, but I still had to like say, let's hold out individual violence, which you know, has a lot in common, but but individuals choose to engage in violence for more and sometimes different reasons. So uh, let's just put that aside so that we can focus a bit. And let's really put aside short incidents of violence because those might have the competition that happens that's not violent. That's that's the normal, normal competition. I was trying to say, let's talk about violent competition because that's kind of the puzzle. So that's really interesting. You said usually people tried to find a narrow definition and you said progress. So you make progress by finding a narrow definition, for example, of military conflict in a particular context. Yeah. And, and progress means, all right, well, how do we prevent this particular kind of military conflict? Or maybe if it's already happening, how do we deescalate it and how do we solve it? <laughs> why it happens and how it can be avoided. Right. And a common, basically like recognize that common principles govern some kinds of behavior that look pretty different. Like an Indian ethnic riot is obviously pretty different than invading a neighboring country, right? But, uh, and that's pretty different than two villages or two gangs. A lot of what I work on is studying organized criminals and gangs. Two gangs going to where you'd think is really different. And, and of course it is, but... But there are some like common principles. You can just think about conflict and the use of violence and um, not learn everything, but just get a lot, just get, get really, really far by sort of seeing the commonalities rather than just focusing on the differences. So again, those words are prolonged groups and violent. Can you maybe linger on each of those words? What does prolonged mean? What's, where's the line between short and long? What does groups mean? And what does violent mean? So let me, you know, I, I have a friend who, um, someone who's become a friend through the process of my work and, and writing this book also, uh, who was 20, 30 years ago, was a, was a gang leader in Chicago. Um, so this guy named Napoleon English or Nap. And I remember one time he was saying, well, you know, when I was young, I used to, I was, he was 15, 16, and he'd go to the neighboring gang's territory he says i'd go gang banging and i said well i didn't know what that meant i said what does that mean and he said oh that just meant i'd shoot him up like I'd shoot him. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he was he was basically trying to send them information and this is what countries do all the time right we have military parades uh and we uh we might have border skirmishes and uh, and and I wanted to sort of so is it what's short is is a is a three month border skirmish a war I mean I don't I don't try to get into those things I don't want to but but I want to point out that like 
it's these long, grueling months and years of violence are, are like the, are the problem and the puzzle. And I just I didn't want to spend a, a lot of time talking about um, the the international version of gang banging. It's a different phenomenon. So what is it about Napoleon that doesn't nap? Let's call him. To, not to add confusion, yeah. that doesn't qualify for war? Is it the individual aspect? Is it that violence is not the thing that is sought, but the um, communication of information is what is sought? Uh, or is it the shortness of it? Is it all of those com uh, it's, it's a little bit, all, I mean, combined? he was the head of a group, or he was becoming the head of a group at that point. Um, and that group eventually did go to war with those neighboring gangs, which is to say it was just long drawn out conflict over months and months and months. But I think one of the big insights from my fields is that, you know, you're constantly negotiating over something, right? Whether you're officially negotiating or you're all posturing, like you're, you're kind of, you're bargaining over something and uh, you should be able to figure out a way to split that pie. And you could use violence, but violence is, everybody's miserable. Like if you're nap, like if you start a war, one, you know, there's lots of risks. You could get killed. That's not good. Uh, you could kill somebody else and go to jail, which is what happened to him. That's not good. Uh, your soldiers get killed. No one's buying your drugs in the middle of a gunfight. So it interrupts your business. And so on and on. It's like, it's really miserable. This is what we're seeing right now, you know, as we're recording, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is now the fourth or fifth week. Everybody's, if, if it didn't dawn on them, what you wanted or be better off without having to fight over it. So there's this, it's just, say, fighting is just politics by other means. And it's just inefficient, costly, brutal, devastating means. And so that's like the deep insight. And so I kind of wanted to say, um, so, so I guess the, like what's not war and I, I mean, I don't, I don't want, I don't try to belabor the definitions because some, some, you know, you, there's reams and reams of political science prof papers written on like what's a war, what's not a war. I, people disagree. Uh, the, I just wanted to say war is the thing that we shouldn't be doing or war is the violence that doesn't make sense. There's a whole, a bunch of other violence, including gangbanging and skirmishes and things that might make sense uh precisely because they're cheap ways of communicating or they're their way they're, they're 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 not particularly costly where's the thing that's just so costly we should be trying to avoid is maybe like the meta way i think about it All right uh nevertheless definitions are interesting so get to the world so you can't listen to necessarily information like self-report data, you have to kind of look past that somehow. Maybe look, especially in the modern world, as much as possible at the data. How many bombs dropped? How many people killed? How the number of the estimates of the number of troops moved from one location to another, and that kind of thing. And the the other interesting thing is there's. Um, <laughs> It's great. <laughs> so it's great because, again, as you do an extensive quantification of justice, mm -hmm. you start to think what actually contributes to our thought that, for example, World War II is a just war and other wars are not. Um, a, a lot of it is about intent and some of the other factors like that you look at, which is prolonged the degree of violence that is necessary versus not necessary given the greater good of some measure of the greater good of people all those kinds of things the then there's reasons for war you know looking to free people or to stop a genocide versus uh conquering land all those kinds of things and people try to put a number behind it and a and lot it's of based on i mean I, what i'm trying to imagine is I mean, suppose I wake up and, or it's whatever my, suppose I think my God tells me to do something or, or my, my God thinks that, uh, or my moral sense thinks that something that another group is doing is repugnant. I'm curious, like, are they evaluating like the, 
validity of that claim or just the idea that like, well, you said it was repugnant, you deeply believe that, therefore it's just? I think, uh, and that could be corrected on, on a lot of this, but I think this is always looking at wars after they happened. So it's, and trying to take a global perspective from all sort of a general survey of how people perceive. So you're not weighing disproportionately the opinions of the people who waged the war. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of ended up dodging that because, I mean, w one is to just point out that wars, actually most wars aren't necessary. And so in the sense that there, there's, there's another way to get what you wanted. Um, and so on, on one level, there's no just war. Now that that's not true because... <laughs> that you have a very specific purpose, you communicate that purpose honestly with the global community, and you strike hard, fast, and you pull out uh, to do sort of, it's like rescue missions. It's almost like policing work. If there's somebody suffering, you go in and stop that suffering directly, and that's it. I, I think World War II is seen in that way, that there's an obvious aggressor that is causing a lot of suffering. As hard and as fast as possible to stop the expansion of the suffering. And so that's kind of how they see. I don't know if you can kind of look with this uh, framework that you presented and look at Hitler and think, well, it's not in his interest to attack uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, Britain, France, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, America, the United States of America. Uh, same, same with Japan. What is it in their interest? Long-term interest? I don't know. I, I it. Uh, so for me who cares about alleviating human suffering in the world, yes, it's not, it seems like almost no war is just, but it also seems somehow deeply human to fight. And I think your book makes the case, no, it's not. Can you, can you try to like get at that? Cause it seems that war, there is some, that, like drum of war seems to beat in all human hearts. Like it's in there somewhere. Maybe it's, maybe that's like a relic of the past and we need to get rid of it. It's deeply irrational. Okay, so obviously we go to war and obviously there's a lot of violence. And so we have to explain something and, and some of that's going to be aspects of our humanness. So so I guess what I, I wanted us to sort of start with a, I think it was just useful to sort of start and point out, actually, you know, there's really, 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 really strong incentives not to go to war because it's going to be really costly. And so all of these other human or strategic things, all these things, the circumstantial things that will eventually lead us to go to war have to be pretty powerful before we go there. And and Can most I, of the time... Sorry to interrupt. Uh, and that's you, why you also describe, very importantly, that war throughout human history is actually rare. We right. usually avoid it. You know, most people don't know about the U.S. invasion of Haiti in 1994. I mean, I mean, a lot of people know about it, but people just don't pay attention to it. We don't, we, we, we're going to, you know, the history books and school kids are going to learn about the invasion of Afghanistan for decades and decades. And nobody is going to put this one in the in the history books and it's because it it didn't actually happen because uh before the troops could land the person who'd taken power in a coup basically said fine there, there's this famous story where where colin powell goes to haiti to this new dictator who's refused to let a democratic president take power and um and tries to convince him to step down or else and he says no 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 and and then he shows them a video and it's basically troop planes and all these things taking off. And he's like, this is not live. This is two hours ago. So it's a, and, and, and basically he basically gives up right there. So th that was, that's a powerful move. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think Powell might have been one of his teachers in a, like a U.S. military college because a lot of these military dictators were trained at some point. And so they had some, there was some personal relationships at least between people in the U.S. government and this guy that they were trying to use. The The point is, is and that that's, that's like what should have happened. Like that makes sense, right? Like, yeah, I'm, maybe I could mount an insurgency and yeah, I'm not going to bear a lot of the cost of war because I'm the dictator and maybe he's human and he just wants to fight or gets angry or it's just in his mind, whatever he's doing. But at the end of the day, it's like, this does not make sense. Um, and that's another, one another, or they look at the ethnic groups that could fight with one another because they have, there's some tension and they're right next to one another and and then whatever, some number like 999 out of a thousand don't, don't fight. Um, because they just find some other way. They don't like each other, but they, they just loathe in peace because that's the sensible thing to do. Uh, and that's what we all do. We loathe in peace. Uh, and we loathed the Soviet Union in, in relative peace for decades and India uh, loathes Pakistan in peace. I mean, two weeks into the Russian invasion of Ukraine, again, it was in the newspapers, but most people didn't. I think, take note, India accidentally launched a cruise missile at Pakistan and calm ensued. So they were like, yeah, this is, we do not want to go to war. This will be bad. Uh, we'll, ex we'll be angry, but we'll accept your explanation that this was an accident. And so, um, so these things find to the radar. And so we overestimate, I think, how likely it is sides are going to fight. But then, of course, things do happen. Like, Russia did invade the Ukraine and didn't find some negotiated deal. And so, uh, and so then the book is sort of about half the book is just sort of laying out well, actually like there's just different ways this breaks down. And some of them are human. Some of them are this, the, I, I actually don't think war beats in our heart. It does a little bit, but we're actually very cooperative. We're as a, as a species, we're deeply, deeply cooperative we're really really good the, so the are the thing we're not we're, we're okay at violence and we're okay and we're okay at getting angry and vengeant and we have principles that will sometimes lead us but we're actually really 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 good at cooperation and and so that's again you know i i don't i'm not trying to write some big optimistic book where everything's going to be great and we're all happy and we don't really fight it's more just to say let's start let's be like a doctor as a doctor we're going to focus on the sick Right. I'm going to try. I know there's sick people, but I'm going to recognize that the normal state is health and that most people are healthy. And, and that's going to make me a better doctor. And that's, I'm kind of saying the same thing. Let's be better doctors of politics in the world by recognizing that like the normal state is health. And then we're going to identify like what are the diseases that are causing this warfare. So, yeah, the natural state of the human body with the immune system and all the different parts. Uh, wants to be healthy and is really damn good at being healthy, but sometimes it breaks. There's sort of things that rhyme, right? In, in sort of, you know, because it's not all the same. There's like lots of reasons to go to war. There's this great line, you know, there's a reason for every war and a war for every reason. And that's true. And it's kind of overwhelming, right? And, and, and it's overwhelming for a lot of people. It was overwhelming for me for a lot of time. And I think... I think one of the gifts of this of social science is actually people have started to organize this for us, and I just tried to organize it a, like a tiny bit better. Buckets that rhyme. Buckets, with, yeah, the with some economics metaphor, right? <laughs> I'm right. at metaphors. So, so the idea was that like that basic incentive, like something overrides these incentives, and and I guess I was saying there's five ways there that they get overrided, and three are I'd call strategic, like they're they're kind of logical. There's circumstances that. Um, and, and, and this is, they're sort of where strategic is, strategy is like this the, the game theory is, is you could use those two things interchangeably, but, but game theory is sort of making it sound more complicated, I think, than it is. It's basically saying that there's times when this is like the optimal choice because of circumstances. And, and, and one of them is when the people who are deciding don't bear those costs. So that's, or, or maybe even have a private incentive that's going to. That's, that's, if they don't, if they're ignoring the cost, then maybe the costs of war are not so material. Uh, that's a contributing factor. Another is just, there's uncertainty and we could talk about that, but there's just the absence of information means that it actually, there's circumstances where it's your best choice to attack. 
There's this thing that political economists call commitment problems, which are basically saying there's some big power shift that you can avoid by attacking now. So it's like a dynamic incentive. It's sort of saying, well, in order to keep something from happening in the future, I can attack now. And because of the structure of incentives, it actually makes sense for me, even though war is, in theory, uh, really costly. Or it is really costly, nonetheless. And then... yet a legal dispute, right? Like we just have a dispute with a neighbor or somebody else. Most of us don't end up going to court. Going to court is like the war option. That's the costly thing that we just ought to be able to avoid. We ought to be able to find something between ourselves that doesn't, you know, require this hiring lawyers and a long drawn out trial. And most of the time we do, right? And so, so we all understand that incentives. And then for those five buckets, so everything except all the irrational and the misperceptions are really easy to model. Then in, from a technical standpoint, it's actually pretty tricky to model the misperceptions. And I'm not a game theorist, uh, and so I'm, I'm more channeling my colleagues who do this and, and what I know. Um, but but it's not rocket science. I mean, I think that's what I that's try to what I try to lay out in the book is like there's this all this all these ideas out there that that can actually help us just make sense of all these wars. Um, and, and just some, bring some order to the morass of re reasons. Well, to push back a lot of things in one sentence. So first of all, rocket science is actually pretty simple. <laughs> People, I think. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you, actually. Well, I think it's because, unfortunately, it's very, like engineering, it's very well-defined. The problem is well-defined. The problem with humanity is it's actually complicated. Yeah. So it is true it's not rocket science, but it is not true it's easy because it's not rocket science. But the 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 problem, the the downside of of game theory is not that it helps us make sense of the world. It projects a simple model of the world that brings us comfort in thinking we understand. Yeah. And sometimes that simplification is actually getting at the core first principles on uh, understanding of something and sometimes it fools us into thinking we understand so for example i mean mutually assured destruction is a very simple model and people argue all the time whether that's actually a good model or not but you know there's empirical fact that we're still alive as a human civilization and also in the game theoretic sense do we model individual leaders and their relationships. Do we, um, the staff, the generals, uh, or do we also um, have to model the culture, the people, yeah. the, the, the suffering of the people, the economic frustration or the anger, the distrust? Do you have to model all those things? Do they come into play? Uh, and sometimes, I mean, again, we could be romanticizing those things from a historical perspective. But when you look at history and you look at the way wars start, it sometimes feels like a little bit of a misunderstanding escalates, 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 and uh, just builds on top of itself. And all of a sudden it's an all out war. Um, it's the escalation with nobody hitting the brakes. So, so, I mean, you're absolutely right in the, like, in the sense that it's totally possible to oversimplify these things and take the... ...make that mistake. I think that's not the mistake that most people make most often. And, yeah. and what's actually true is I think most people were actually really quick, whether it's the, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan or Iraq, were really quick to blame that on the humanness and the culture and the, so we're really quick to say oh this was george w bush's either desire for revenge and vengeance or some private agenda or blood for oil um so we're really quick to blame it on these things and then we're really we, we tend to overlook the strategic incentives to to attack which i think were probably dominant i think those things might have been true to a degree but i don't think they were enough to ever you know, bring those wars about. Just like I think people are very quick to sort of, in this current invasion, to sort of talk about Putin's um, 
grand visions of being the next Catherine the Great or 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 nationalist ideals or and and the mis mistakes and the miscalculations were really quick to sort of say oh that that must be and then kind of pause and or not pause but maybe even stop there and not see some of the strategic incentives and so so I I guess we have to do both um, but the strategic I, I guess I would say like the war is just such a big problem and it's just so costly that the strategic incentives and, and the things that game theory has given us are like really important in understanding why there was so little room for negotiation and a bargain that things like a leader's mistakes start to matter or a leader's nationalist ideals or delusions or vengeance actually matters because those do matter, but they only matter when the capacity to find a deal is so narrow because of the circumstances. And so let's not, let's, it's sort of like saying, um, like an elderly person who dies of pneumonia, right? Pneumonia killed them, obviously, but that's not the reason pneumonia was able to kill them. All of the fundamentals and the circumstances were like, made them very fragile. And that's how I think all the strategic forces make that situation fragile. And then the miscalculations and the all of these things you just said, which are so important, are kind of like the pneumonia. And let's sort of, let's pay attention to both. And you're saying that people don't... Hand this over, they hand it over. And uh, and that's why, that's why there are so many unequal imperial relationships in the world. That's what empire is. Empire is success of people saying, fine, we'll give up our some degree of freedom or sovereignty because you're too powerful. And the Ukrainians said, no way. Uh, this is just too precious. And so I said one of those buckets were that there are, there's a set of values. There's sometimes there's something that we value that is so valuable to us and important. Sometimes it's it's terrible. Sometimes it's the extermination of a, another people. But sometimes it's something noble like liberty or refusal to part with sovereignty and and in those circumstances, people will decide I will endure the costs. They probably, I mean, I think this, I think I think they knew what they were probably risking. Um, and so, to me, that that's not to blame the Ukrainians any more than I would blame Americans for the American Revolution. It's actually a very similar story. You had a tyrannical, militarily superior, um, pretty non-democratic entity come and say, you're going to have partial sovereignty. And Americans for ideological reasons said, no way. And that, you know, people like Bernard Bale and other historians, that's like the dominant story of the American revolution. It was in the ideological origins, this attachment, this idea of liberty. And so I start now there's lots of other reasons I think why this happened, but I think for me, it starts with Ukrainians failing to make that sensible quote unquote rational deal that says we should we should relinquish some of our sovereignty because Russia is more powerful than we are. So there's a very clinical look at the war. Meaning there is a man and a country, Vladimir Putin, that has makes a claim on a land builds up troops and invades. Yeah. And now we have regained some of our strength. We've consolidated political control. We've cowed our people. We have a stronger economy. And we somehow got Germany and other European nations to give up energy independence. And actually just, we've got an enormous amount of leverage over you. And now we want to roll back some of your success because we we're powerful enough to demand it. And, and you've been taking advantage of the situation, which is maybe a fair impartial analysis. And, uh, in the West, but more specifically Ukraine said, but that's a price too high, which I totally respect. I would, maybe I'd like to think I'd make that same decision but that is that's the answer if the if the answer is why would they fight if it's so costly why not find a deal it's because they weren't willing to
to give Russia the thing that their power said they quote unquote deserved. Just like Americans said to the Britain, yeah, of course you you we ought to accept semi sovereignty. Um, but we are just we refuse, and we'd rather endure a bloody fight that we might lose than than take this. And so. Um, so you need some of these other five buckets. You need them to understand the situation. You need to sort of there, there are other things going on, but I but I do think it's fundamental that there's just that this it this noble intransigence is like a big is a big part of it. Well, let me just say a few things if it's okay. Yeah. So your analysis is um is clear and objective. My analysis is neither clear nor objective. Winter. And, you know, a lot of people, and that pisses me off, because if you, if you know your history, it's not the winter that stopped Hitler. It's the Red Army. It's the people that refused to back down. They fought proudly. That pride... That's something. That's the human spirit. That's in war, you know, war is hell, but it really pushes people to to stand for the things they believe in. It's the the the, the William Wallace speech from Braveheart. I think about this a lot. That does not fit into your framework. No, no, no. I I'm going to disagree. I I think it totally fits in and it's it's this, there's nothing irrational about what we believe, especially those principles which we hold the most dear, right? I'm, I'm merely trying to say that there's a, there's a calculus, there's one calculus over here that says Russia's more powerful than it was 20 years ago and even 10 years ago and Ukraine is not and it's asking for something and, and there's an incentive to give that up. That's obvious. Like there's an incentive to comply. But my understanding is many of these post-Soviet republics have appeased, right? Which is what we call compromise when we disagree with it. They've, all of these other peoples in the Russian sphere of influence have, have not stood up. Uh, and Russians, many Russians have tried to stand up and they've been beaten down. Um, and now people have, if, we'll see, but people have not been standing up very much. And so lots of people are cowed and lots of people have appeased and lots of people hear that speech and think, I would like to do that, but but don't. And and so, and my point is that sadly, we live in a world where a lot of people uh, get stepped on by tyrants and empire and whatnot and don't rise up and so so i think we could admire especially when they stand up for these reasons and i think we can admire churchill for that reason i think we could that's why we admire the leaders of the american revolution and so on but it doesn't always happen and i i don't actually know why but i don't think it's irrational i think it's just it's it's something it's about a set of values and it's hard to predict and it was hard for hard for, i i it, Putin might not have been out of line in thinking just like everybody else in my sphere of influence, they're going to roll over too. And I should mention, because we haven't, that a lot of this calculation from an objective point of view, you have to include the United States and NATO into the pressure they apply into the region. Yeah. That's... <laughs> I think um, the authoritarianness of Russia and Putin's control or the control of his cabal is the other thing I would really point to is what's going on here. And if I had to, if you asked me like big picture, what do I think is the fundamental cause of most violence in the world? I think it's unaccountable power. I think, in fact, for me, an unaccountable power is the source of underdevelopment. It's the source of pain and suffering. It's the source of of warfare. It's, it's basically the root source of most of our problems. And in this particular case, it's also one of our buckets in the sense that, like, why, what is it that, why did Russia ask these things? Like, well, it was democracy in, the, in, in Ukraine 
a threat to an average Russian? No. Was capitalism, is NATO, is whatever, is this a threat to average Russians? No. It's a threat to the apparatus of political control and economic control that Putin and cronies and the sort of group of people that that rule, this elite in Russia, um, it was a threat to them. And so they had to ask the Ukraine to be neutral or to give up NATO or to have a puppet government or whatever they were seeking to achieve and have been trying to achieve through other means for decades, right? They've been trying to undermine these things without uh, invasion. And I would love to hear and to celebrate the beautiful Russian people, the Ukrainian people, and anyone who silences that beautiful voice of the people anywhere in the world is destroying the thing that um, I value most about humanity. Leaders don't matter. They're supposed to serve the people. This nationalist idea of a people, of a country, is only makes any sense when you celebrate, when you give people um, the freedom to show themselves, to celebrate themselves. And the, the thing I matter, I care most about is science and the silencing of voices in the scientific community, the silencing of voices, period. Fuck any leader that silences that human spirit. Um, there's something about this. It's it, like, whenever I look at World War II, whenever I look at wars, it does seem very irrational to fight, but man, does it seem somehow deeply human when the people stand up and fight? Uh, there's something uh, that if, you, you know, we talked about progress, that feels like how progress is made. The people that stand and fight. So well, let me read the Churchill speech. It's such, <laughs> I'm so proud that we humans can stand up to evil when the time is right. I guess here's the thing though, Think of what's happening in Xinjiang in China. We have a, we have appeased China. We've basically said you can just do really, really, really horrible things in this region, and we're you're too powerful for us to do anything about it, and it's not worth it. And and there's nobody standing up and making a Churchill speech or a the Braveheart speech about standing up for people of of Xinjiang when when what's happening is. Um, on you know in that in that in that realm of what was happening in Europe, and and that's happening in a lot of places. Um, and then when we when when there is a willingness to stand up, people there's a lot of opposition to those. You know, pe you know. So there were a lot of reasons for the invasion of Iraq. Um, for some, it was a humanitarian thing. Like Saddam Hussein was one of the worst tyrants of the 20th century, he was just doing some really horrible things. You know, he'd invaded Kuwait, he'd, you know, committed domestic, attempted domestic genocide and all sorts of repression. And it was probably a mistake to invade in spite. So it's important not just to select on the cases where we stood up and to select on the cases where that ended up working out uh, in the sense of victory. Right, it's important to sort of try to judge, not judge, but just try to understand these things in the context of all the times we didn't give that speech or when we did and then it just went sideways. Well, that's why it's powerful when you would. Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. This is before Hitler had any major loss to anybody. That was a terrifying armada coming your way. We shall never surrender. I just want to give props. Uh, I want to give my respect as a human being uh, to Churchill to the British people for standing up. 
to the Ukrainian people for standing up and for um, and to the Russian people. These are great people that throughout history have stood up to evil. Let me ask you this, because you quote Sun Tzu in The Art of War. There's no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. This is the main thesis. Can we just linger on this? Since leaders wage war and people pay the price, when we say that there's no reason to do prolonged war, is it possible to have a reason for the leaders if they disregard the price? So, sort of like uh, if they have a different objective function or utility function that measures the price that's paid for war. Is that one explanation of why war happens? Is the leaders just have a different calculus than other humans? I mean, I think this links us back to what we were talking about earlier about just war. Is In yeah. some sense, just war is saying that in spite of the costs, that there's some... There's... And therefore, we're going to go to war despite these material costs and these human costs. So that, and, and, and that's, and then, and then that principle that you go to war on is in the eye of the beholder. And I mean, I think liberty and, 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 and sovereignty, I think we can understand and sympathize with, and maybe that's just a universal, maybe that's the greatest cause of just war, but other people make that could go to war for something considerably less, a principle that's considerably less noble, right? Which is what Hitler was doing. Um, that's an explanation. So that's a whole class of explanations that helps us understand that the compromise that was on the table, given the relative balance of power, was just repugnant at least to one side, if not the other. There's something they're unwilling to part with. That's, And then you get to the leaders. Well, what happens when what the leaders want, when, what happens when the leaders are detached from the interests of their groups, which has been true for basically most of human history. There's a narrow slice of societies in the big scheme of things that have been accountable to their people. A lot of them exist today um, where to some degree they're channeling the interests of their group, right? So the Ukrainian politicians didn't concede to these cool Russian demands because even if they had, it would have been political suicide because it seemed, or I think, I don't, it seems that the Ukrainians would have just rejected this. So they were in some sense channeling the values of the broader population. Even if they, I don't know what was going on. Even, and if they didn't share those principles, they self-interestedly followed them. Probably they shared them, but I, I'm just saying that even if they didn't, they wouldn't compromise. Occasionally you get the reverse, which is where the leaders are not accountable. And now they have some value, which could be glory. I mean, this is the story of the kings and to some lesser extent, the queens of Europe for hundreds of years was it was basically a contest and it was the war was the sport of kings and to some extent they were just seeking status through violent competition and they paid a lot a big price out of the royal purse but but uh but they didn't bear most of the suffering um and and so they were too quick to go to war and so that's i think that detachment of leaders combined with, you know, you mingle it with this, that one bucket, that unchuckedness, and you mingle that with the fact that, that leaders might have one of these values, noble or otherwise, that carry them to war combined to explain a good number of conflicts as well. For me, the meta cause of, of conflict in all of human history and sadly today. Does the will to power play into this, the desire for power? Like that's a human thing again in the calculation that, shall we put that in the misperceptions bucket? Or is it, is misperceptions essentially about interaction between humans and power is more about the thing you feel in your heart when you're alone yeah. as, a, as a leader? You know, I said there were three strategic reasons like the unchecked leaders the commitment problems uncertainty there are two sort of more psychological and i call them intangible incentives and misperceptions the way that like a game theorist or the way that a 
behavioral economists would think about those two is just to say preferences and then erroneous beliefs and mistakes is like, so the pre our preferences are our preferences. Yeah. Right. And so utility sure. functions, whatever we want to call it, like there's not, th that's why I would, wouldn't call them a misperception or rationality. Our, we, we want, we like what we like. Yeah. If we like power, if we like relative status, if we yeah. like, uh, if we like our racial purity, if we like our liberty, if we like whatever it is that we have convinced ourselves we value. Maybe you fell in love with a rival queen, a king. Exactly. When I said it was a big bucket full of stuff that rhymes, like though that's a pretty messy bucket. Like there's a lot of different stuff in there. And I, I'm just trying to say like, let's be clear that just about the law, the shared logic of these things is maybe just, you know, they're really dissimilar, but let's be clear about the shared logic. Uh, and if it were true that deep down we were aggressive people who just liked violence and enjoyed the blood or some percentage of us do, that would be there too. Um, and so I just want to say that's, it, it, but you know, we're really quick to recognize those, right? When we diagnose a war as an armchair, analyst or as a journalist or something we really jump to those we don't need a lot of help to like see those happening we so we probably put a little bit too much emphasis on them is maybe the only thing that i would caution because we're the others are more subtle and they're often there and they contribute so i just to link on something you said before would it be accurate to say when the leaders become detached from um, the opinion of the people is that's more likely to lead to war. So, uh, and mechanically, it's just they're they're going to bear fewer costs. So it's going to it's going to basically narrow the set of deals that they're going to be willing to accept instead of violence. At the same time, most of the time, it's not enough because the, the, the leaders still bear a lot of costs of war. You could be deposed, you could be killed, you could be tried. And the public purse is going to be empty. I mean, that's like the one story throughout history is at the end of the day, your regime is broke as a result of war. And so you still internalize that a little bit. Um, if I had to say like, you know, in my three buckets or through my buckets so far, I've sort of started with like Ukrainian and transigence. And then I jumped and then I said the essential, then you really have to understand Russian autocracy for the, just to understand why they would ask something so cruel. But I mean, I think the uncertainty is really important here as well. Like if you think of it, like think of all of the things, the way this has played out and just in some ways, how many, how in how many ways we've been surprised. We've been surprised by Putin asking this terrible price and expecting Ukraine to roll over or the West to roll over at least to a degree was based on like a different set of probability. It was based on just expecting something in the middle of the probability distribution and not one of all these different tail events. And so the fact that the world's so uncertain and the fact that Putin can come with a different set of expectations than the Ukrainians and the West and all these players can just have a hard time agreeing on just what the facts are because we live in an uncertain world. Everyone's quick to say, oh, we miscalculated. Well, I'm not, I don't know if he miscalculated. I think he just, he got a really bad draw on, in terms of the, what the realized outcomes are here. And so that, I mean, good for everybody else in some sense, except, you know, the fact that it's involving a lot of violence is the tragedy. So well, well there's also economic pain, yeah. not just for the Russian people and the Ukrainian people, but the whole world. The whole world. Yeah. So it, it you know, uh, you could, you could talk about things that you, we are surprised from an analysis perspective of, of small victories here or there, but I think it's, you know, the, the uncertainty in the circumstance, you don't have to miscalculate the fact that you, if you bluff and lose, it doesn't, it's not you miscalculated, you made an optimal choice given the uncertainty of the situation to take a gamble. And that was a wiser thing for you to do than to not bluff and just to fold or to just not pay in that round. 
And so the uncertainty of the situation gives both sides incentives to bluff, gives neither side an incentive to try to reveal the truth. And then at some point, the other side says, you know what? You say you're resolved. You say you're not going to, you're going to mount an insurgency. Well, guess what? Every other, you know, people on my border has folded and you're going to fold too the minute the tanks roll in and the minute the Air Force comes in. I'm gambling that you're bluffing. And, uh, and so we, that, that inherent uncertainty of the situation just causes a lot of short wars, actually. Given so far, which is like a, an unwillingness to do that without fighting on the part of the Ukrainians, uh, an autocratic leadership in Russia who would make those demands because it's in their self-interest and then uncertainty leading them to, to fight. And, 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 and that sadly is like the best case. That feels like the best case scenario right now, which is the war is just five months and not five years. Given the current situation, given the current situation, because the, the suffering has already happened. It lost homes, people moving, you know, having to see their um, their home in rubble and millions of people, refugees having to escape the country. Um, and hate flourishes versus the common humanity as, as it does with war. And on top of all of that, if we talk from a geopolit uh, geopolitical perspective, the warmongers all over the world are sort of uh, drooling. They now have got narratives and they got the, whatever narratives, you can go shopping for the narratives. The United States has its narratives for whatever geopolitical thing it wants to do in that part of the world. Um, that's another that's another little malevolent interaction between two of these buckets, like those unchecked leaders and Semitism was present throughout the world. But the the more subtle thing that I feel like may be more generally applicable is this kind of pacifism that I think people in the United States felt like it's it doesn't, it's not my conflict. Why do I need to get involved with it? And I think uh, Churchill was fighting um, that, the general- Apathy. Uh, it's like, it's, it's the apathy of rational calculus. Like, uh, it's like, what are we going to gain if we fight back? Like, Hitler seems to be pretty reasonable. He's saying he's not going, he's going to stop the bombing. There, you're still going to uh, maintain your sovereignty as the great people of Britain. Like, why, why are we fighting again? And that's the thing that's hard to break because you have to say, well, uh, you have to speak to principle. You have to speak at some greater sort of long-term vision of history. So, so like, yes, now it may seem like it's a way to avoid the fight, but you're actually just sort of putting shackles on yourself. You're destroying yeah. the very greatness of, of, of our people if we don't fight back. And to think about this with like the current case with Russia, I mean, some people look at Putin's speeches and papers he's written on Ukraine historically being a part of Russia and trying to deny the basically create all these nationalist narratives and they think well Putin really believes and he might Putin really believes this and that's why he's invading and that might also be true and that would contribute to just make a, a peaceful bargain even harder to find but I, I I suspect what's at least a minimum true is Putin's trying to manufacture support for an invasion in the population through propaganda and um and so he's doing on some level the same thing that winston churchill was doing in mechanical terms which is to try to manipulate people's preferences and 
but doing it in a in a sinister malevolent evil self-serving way because it's really in his interest whereas this was anything but right in the churchill example the dark human thing is like uh there's moments in world war ii where hitler's propaganda he began he began to believe his own propaganda it's like i think he probably always believed i think he was a sincere believer well no 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 there's but there's a lot of places in um where there was uncertainty yeah and they decided to do propaganda Uh and that propaganda resolved the uncertainty in his own mind like so for example he believed until very late that America is a weakling militarily and as an economic power and just the spirit of the people. And like that was part of the propaganda they're producing. And because of that propaganda, when he became the head of the army, he was making military actions. He like nonchalantly started war with America, with the United States of America, where it did he didn't need to at all. He could have avoided that completely, but he thought, eh, whatever doesn't they're easy so that that's has i think that propaganda first belief second and i think as a as a uh, values of your leader become more important when they're unchecked but the uncertainty point you just made is like a deep point it's to say actually that like the fundamental problem that all autocrats have is an information problem because nobody wants to give them the right information. Yeah. And they, they have very few ways to aggregate information if they're not popular, right? And so so there's a whole cottage industry of political science sort of talking about why do, like why autocrats love fixed elections and why they love Twitter and why they actually like it in a controlled way is it's, it solves an information problem. Like that's your crucial, if you're like Xi Jinping or, 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 Vladimir Putin, you need to solve an information problem just to avoid having a rebellion on your hands in your own country every day. To me, in in the fog of uncertainty, how sort of seemingly likely nuclear war became. Not likely, but how it Less unlikely than before. Exactly. That's a better way to say it. It started to take a random stroll away from 0% probability into this kind of land of maybe, like, it's hard to know, but it's like, oh, wow, we're actually normally talking about this as if this is part of the calculus, part of the options. But before we talk about nuclear war, because I'm going to need a drink, um, uh, do you need to go to the bathroom? Sure, I'll take a break. Back to nuclear war. What do you think about this? That people were nonchalantly speaking about nuclear wars if it doesn't lead to the potential annihilation of the human species. Um, What are the chances that our world descends into nuclear war? Within your framework, you you wear many hats. Yeah. One (laughs) is uh, sort of the... And now, uh, analyst, right? And then one is a human. What do you think are the chances we get to see nuclear war in the century? Well, you know, the, the doomsday, the official doomsday clock for nuclear warfare sits in the lobby of my building. Um, it, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists sort of shares a building with us. So it's, it's always... I mean, it's actually, it hasn't moved as close to, it hasn't moved as close to um, midnight in the last few weeks as it probably should have only because it was already so close. There's actually limited room for it to move for a bunch of other reasons. I think it's, it, it, there's a whole political thing that once it's really hard, it's really easy to move it closer. And it's really hard if you're the person in charge of that clock to move it away, right? Because that's always very controversial. So it, it always sits there, but it, it, it forces you to think about it a little bit every day. Um, and I admit I was nonchalant about it in till recently in a way that many, many other people were. Um, I still think the risk is very low, but um, kind of for the reasons we've talked, it's just so 
you know, unimaginably costly that nobody wants to go that route. So, so it's like the, it's like the extreme version of my whole argument with why we most of the time don't fight is because it's just so damn costly. And so this is, that's, that's the incentive not to use this. And, and, and if they do use it, that's the incentive to use it in a very restrained way. Um, but that's not a lot of complete Armageddon is unimaginable, but I remember something that, uh, I, when both of those questions get asked, I remember financial collapse and they said, you know what? The risk is vanishingly small, but that's terrifying because until recently the answer was zero. And so the fact that it's not zero should deeply, deeply scare us all. And we should devote a lot of energy to making it zero again. And that's how I feel about the risk of a civil war in the US. And that's how I feel about the risk of nuclear war is it's higher than it used to be. And that should terrify us all. To me, what terrifies me is that all this kind of stuff seems to happen like overnight, like super quick and it escalates super quick when it happens. So it's not like, I don't know. I, I don't know what I imagine, but it just happens like if a nuclear war happened, it would be something like a plane, like in this case with Ukraine, uh, a NATO plane shut down over some uh, piece of land mm -hmm. uh, by the uh, Russian forces, or so the narrative would go, but it doesn't even matter what's true or not in order to spark the first um moment of escalation and then it just goes 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 well i think that happens sometimes i mean again it's this thing that you know what social scientists call it selection on the dependent variable like there's all these times when that didn't happen when it stopped when it escalated one step and then people paused or it escalated two steps and people said whoa 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 um and and so we remember yeah. the times when it went boom 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 and then the really terrible thing happened but that Fortunately, that's not, you know, I start off the book with an example of a gang war that didn't happen in, in, in Medellin, Colombia, which is third. That's how my day job is actually studying conflict and gangs and violence and at, of these other kinds of groups, also very sinister. Um, and, and most of the time they don't fight and they, that escalation doesn't happen. So, so the escalation does happen quickly sometimes, except when it doesn't. Which yeah, so we remember the ones when it does. It's really important to think about all that. Like, um, <laughs> I remember talking to, I, I think, Elon Musk on this podcast. I was sort of like talking about the horrors of war and so on. And then he said, well, you know, like most of human history, because uh, I think I said like most of human history is, um, had been defined by these horrible wars he's like no most of human history is just peaceful like farming life <laughs> like war yeah. we kind of remember the wars but most of human history is just you know is life and yeah and most rare. of the competition between nations was like blood i would say blood thirsty without drinking that blood in the sense that it was intense it would loathe some and so a lot of the rivalry and a lot of the competition, which is also can be problematic in its own ways, is not violent. And most of human history is about the oppression of the majority by a few. And the, there are moments when they rise up and revolt and there's a revolution. We remember those, but most of the time they don't. And, um, and the story of political change and transformation and freedom is, is there's a few revolutions that are violent, but most of it is actually revolutions without that kind of violent revolt revolt. Most of it is just the peaceful concession of power by elites to a wider and wider group of people in response to their increased economic bargaining power, their threat that they're going to march. So, so even if we want to understand something like the march of freedom over human history, I think we can draw this same insight that, that actually we don't, we, most of the time we don't fight. We actually concede power. No, you don't, you don't, 
the elite doesn't sort of give power to the masses right away. They just co-opt the few merchants who could threaten the whole thing and bring them into the circle. And then the circle gets a little bit wider and a little bit wider until the circle is ever wider. Maybe not ever, but encompasses most, if not all. And that's like a hopeful and optimistic trend. Yeah, if you look at the plot, if you guys could pull it up of the the wars throughout history, the, so the rate of wars throughout history does seem to be decreasing significantly with a few spikes, and uh, the sort of the expansion. It's like half the world is under authoritarian regimes, but that's been shrinking and shrinking. And shrinking. <laughs> then when they do happen, they're doozies. So is Pinker right? I hope he's right, but I, I don't think that officially that trend is there. I think mm, there, we might have, you know, the same kind of levels of intergroup violence because maybe those five fundamentals that lead to war have not fundamentally changed and thus made us, given us a more peaceful world, world now than a couple hundred years ago. That's something to think about. So obviously looking at his hypothesis, looking at his data and others like him. But I have noticed one thing, which is the amount of pushback he gets. Yeah. That there is this, this is speaking to the general point that you made, which is like we overemphasize the anecdotal, like the, and don't, look objectively at the aggregate data as much. There's a general cynicism about the world and not, I don't even mean cynicism, it's almost like cynicism porn or something like that where people just get, for some reason they get a little bit excited to talk about the destruction of yeah. human civilization in a, in a weird way. Like they don't really mean it, I think. If I were to like psychoanalyze their geopolitical analysis is i don't i think it's a kind of um i don't know maybe it relieves the mind to think about death mm -hmm. at a global scale somehow and then you can go have lunch with your kids afterwards and feel a little better about the world i don't yeah. know what it is but that it's not very scientific it's very kind of personal emotional and so we shouldn't we should be careful to look at the world in that way because uh the if you look broadly there is just just like how you highlight there's a will for peace uh, uh among people yeah uh gang wars in colombia medellin uh what's the economics of peace and war between dark uh, drug cartels here's what was really insightful for me so i live in chicago and Chicago, people are aware that there's a violent problem in Chicago. It's actually not the worst American city by any stretch of the imagination for shootings, but it's pretty bad. Um, and Medellin has these better, much, many more and probably many better organized gangs than uh, Chicago. Uh, and yet the homicide rate is maybe half. Um, and uh, now, I mean, there have been moments when these gangs go to war in the last 30 years when Medellin has become the most violent place on the planet. But for the most part right now, they're peaceful. And, and so what's going on there? Um, I mean, one thing that is there's a, a her there's a hierarchy of organizations so that above these reasonably well-organized neighborhood gangs, there's a set of sort of more shadowy organizations that have different names. Some people call them razones. Some people would call them bandas, criminales, criminal bands. You might just call them mafias. Um, and they, there's about 17 of them, depending on how you want to. They saw the table. Well, each individual one or a as a group? As a group, as a group. So they meet and they don't meet personally all the time. Sometimes they meet, but they consult. A lot of the leaders of these groups are actually in prison. And so, and they're in the same wings in prison. They have represented, oh, they meet in prison. Well, they're, they're whatever. If, if I'm on a cell block with you, I'm meeting you anyways, right? And so actually imprisoning leaders and putting them in the same cell block, but not putting them in, in, you know, if you get arrested here in the United States and you're a criminal leader and you get put in a supermax prison, you cannot run your criminal empire. It's just too difficult. It's impossible. There, it's possible. And you might think, 
and they do. They, they still run their empire. And you might think that's a bad idea, but actually cutting off the head of a criminal organization, leading it to a bunch, leaving it to a bunch of like hot-headed young guys who are disorganized is not always the path to peace. So having these guys all in the same prison patios is actually, it, it, the, the, it, it reduces imperfect information and uncertainty, right? It provides a place for them to bargain. They can talk. And, and so La Oficina is like a lot of these informal meetings. And so, so you know, and, and, and they have these tools that they use to control the street gangs. So instead of there being like 400 gangs, all sort of in this anarchic situation of competing for territory and constantly at war, the Razones are keeping them in line. Um, and they will use sanctions. They will, where they'll, sanction might be, I will put a bullet in your head if you, right. if you don't. It's a little more honest than uh, <laughs> the more, sanctions between nations. Yeah. Exactly. But they will, but they, they will sit them down. They'll, they'll provide, they'll help them negotiate. They will provide, I said there are these things called. Situation. <laughs> In, in wage war, but I'm going to give you a counter incentives. And, and, and so they keep the peace. And so, and it's a little bit, so they're a little bit like the UN security council and peacekeeping forces and sanctions regimes. It's like the same kinds of tools, the same parallels and, and they're imperfect. They don't always work that well. And they're unequal, right? Cause it's not like they're pursuing this in the interests of like democratic blah, blah, blah. Um, but it kind of works until it doesn't. And, and 10 years ago in you know, the mid 1990s, there were wars and it, this breaks down. And I, it kind of gave me this perspective on the international institutions and all the tools we've built. Mediators are a solution to uncertainty and international institutions that can enforce a peace and agreement are a solution to commitment problems. And all of these things can be solutions to these intangible incentives. Actually a pretty good one because those are pretty unequal too. Mm -hmm. And those are pretty imperfect. Like that's, you know, it's, there's these, we have five nations with a veto on the security council and a lot of unequal power and, they're manipulating this in their own self-interest or their group's interests. Um, so, so anyway, so it's actually the, some of the things that work in Medellin and why they work help give me a lot of perspective on what works in the international arena and why we have some of the problems we have is like, so there's not, <laughs> in some deep way, there's not a fundamental difference between those 17 mafia groups. And the UN Security the, Council. The UN Security Council. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're such like, funny descendant of apes. We, just, we, <laughs> we put on suits. I'm sure they wear different. They have yeah. different cultural garbs that they wear. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, that's the sense I got from Pablo Escobar and Jorge Ochoa, who founded the car, the Medellin cartel. Is like uh, having spoken with people on, on this podcast. Talked to Roger Reeves, who was a drug uh, transporter. It seems like there. It seems like it was. Um, I don't know the right term, but it was very kind of professional and calm. It didn't have a sense of danger to it, like it's negotiating. So, like the danger is always on the table as a threat, as part of the calculation. But you're using that threat in order to de-escalate, in order to have peace. Yeah. Everybody is interested in peace. So something that happened last year, we were a little bit able to watch in real time because we had a few contacts. We've been meeting and talking to a lot of these leaders in prison and a bit outside of prison. Many of them will talk to us. Um, and so uh, there, the homicide, I mentioned homicide rate in Medellin's maybe a two thirds or half of the Chicago level. It, it had been climbing. Some of these street level gangs were starting to fight. Um, maybe at sort of the, on some level, it, it, it seems that like maybe some of those Rason leaders were like saying, well, let, you know, we're actually not sure how strong these guys are. Let's let them fight just to test it out. Let's have these skirmishes, right? It wasn't prolonged warfare. It was like, let's just sort of feel out how strong everybody is. Cause then we'll be able to reapportion the drug corners and stuff accordingly. So they were kind of feeling each other out through fighting and the homicide rate doubled and then it, and then it increased by the same amount again in 
So it was approaching something that might get out of control, which wasn't in anybody's interest. It wasn't in the government's interest, wasn't in their interest. And so then magically, um, area for three days before they're all moved elsewhere. So the government had a role in this. And then somebody who's like a trusted mediator on the criminal side gets himself arrested and happens to be put in the same spot. And, uh, and a week later, the homicide rate has is 30% of what it was. Uh, is back to its normal, moderate, unfortunately not zero, right? But it's back to where it was uh, because they, it didn't make sense to have a war. And everybody, government, mafia leaders, everybody sort of like, they figured it a way to sort of bargain their way to peace. Can I ask you some, almost like a tangent, but you mentioned you got a chance potentially to talk to a few folks, some were in prison, some were or not. Um, is it productive? Is it interesting? Maybe by way of advice, do you have ideas about talking to people who are actively criminals? Yeah. It really depends on the situation. So like the first time I worked in a conflicted place was in uh, northern Uganda in the maybe the last couple of years of a long running war. So this would have been 2004, 2005. This is a small East African country. And the north of the country had been involved, engulfed in, think of it as like a 20-year a low-level insurgency run by a um, self-proclaimed messiah who wasn't that popular and no one joined his movement, so he would kidnap kids. And, um, and so the, I never, I could talk to people who are, who'd come back from being there. I never once... If I'd wanted to, I, I and I was writing about that armed group, I never talked to anybody who was an active member of that armed group. It was quite rare. It wouldn't have been easy or safe. Um, and that's sometimes true. I'm, I'm starting to do some work in Mexico. True of a Medellin gang, and it's probably true of a Mexico gang, is like you might have your group of 30 people. One or two of them might be shooters. Most people don't shoot. Most people don't like to do that. Uh, or you don't even have any of those people in your group because you're trying to run a business. You don't need any shooters. You can just hire a killer when you need them on contract. And so if somebody's asking questions um, and you don't want them to ask questions or you think they know too much in a way that threatens you uh, and it's cheap for you um, and you have no personal compunctions and you can then you can put a contract out on them and they'll be killed. Uh, that doesn't happen in Colombia. Um, it doesn't happen in Chicago. Uh, pro I don't know. There's lots of reasons for that. I can't say exactly why. I think one reason is like, they know what will happen is, is that there'll be consequences that, that the government will crack down and make them pay. And so they don't do it. Um, and that is not what happened in Mexico. You, you, they don't, they won't kill like a DA agent. They know that the, the U S has made it clear. You kill one of our agents, we will make you pay. And so they, they're very careful to minimize death of American, but, but you kill journalists and nobody comes after them or is able to come after them. And so they've realized they can get away with this. And that seems to be the equilibrium there. That's my, my, that's my initial sense from, and, but that's, we spent a lot of time before we started talking to criminals. You know, I, we spent a year trying to figure out what was safe before we actually, and, and failing. We kept, there are lots of safe things to do. It was also really hard to figure out how to talk to people in these organizations. And we failed 40 times before we figured out a way to actually access people. Is but, it worth it talking to them if you figure out, because it's not never going to be safe. It's going to be uh, when you estimate that there's just some low level of risk. Yeah. Like you what's know, the benefit yeah. as a researcher, as a as a as a scholar of humans? Yeah. So I actually don't think. Let's compare it to something. Okay, you know, I'm in Austin for the first time, mm -hmm. and I'm walking around, and there's all these people buzzing around on these scooters yeah. without helmets. You, we you, we street. need to definitely interview them and say what the <laughs> hell is wrong with you. So nothing I have ever done in my entire career 
is riskier is as risky as that um that's a nice way to compare journalism in a war zone and not, uh, well, scooters there are some yeah there's journalism there some war zones you know i worked in northern uganda and i worked in liberia and i work now in medellin and i'm starting to work in mexico and both the those particular places and then the things i did in those places where i spent a lot of time making sure that what i was doing was not unduly risky hey, hey, uh todd could you pull up a picture of a person on this <laughs> Assess these risks. Yeah, I I think um, there's another aspect to it too. When you're riding a scooter, you're once you're done with the scooter, the risk has disappeared. Yeah, there's something the lingering where you have to look over your shoulder, potentially for the rest of your life as you accumulate all of these conversations. Yeah, I've chosen, but I've also advised my students, and let, I wouldn't go and do this with an armed group that would 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 think i knew too much and therefore some people do that some journalists i think are very brave and take risks and do that and good for them and i'm happy they do that i don't i don't personally i don't personally do that so so the, these guys are very i mean in medicine it's a business they're just they're selling local drugs and they are laundering money for the big cartels and they are um shaking down businesses for money or selling services in some cases and they make a lot of money it's a business and um and they're in prison so they they can talk about most of what they want to talk about because there's no double jeopardy they've been incarcerated for it uh and you're just they're just talking you're just talking shop and they're just you know you're I, so so it's worth it i think because the risk is very low but it's, if you actually want to weaken these organizations, and they're extremely powerful, they're extremely big facet of life in a lot of cities mm -hmm. in the Americas in particular, including in some of the United, some American cities. Uh, if you want to understand how to weaken these groups over time, you have to understand how their business works. And we're like, imagine you were made like the, whatever the oil Cesar of, of <laughs> an industry that happens to be illicit and you have no information and so that's kind of what we do we figure out how the system works and like what are the economic incentives and what are the political incentives and the interviews and conversations help with that they just... help a lot yeah, yeah yeah we do that so we have i mean i don't do i do some of those but i'm on the side my spanish is okay it's not great and you have a translator usually if you ever go directly well if only because I can't understand the street vernacular. Like, I'm just ho totally hopeless. 591 children in three years between oh, 2000. Probably, they must have kidnapped. I, I had a, They probably kidnapped for at least a short time, like a few hours to a day, more than 50,000 kids. As like, a terror tactic? A little bit. I mean, um, you know, most of those people, they just let go after they carried goods. They held on to, they tried to hold on to thousands. The short story, listen, if you're not popular, if you're running an armed movement and you need troops, um, you can, and nobody wants to fight for you, you can either give up or you can have a small clandestine terror organization that tries to, a different set of tactics. But if you want a conventional army and you don't want to give up, then you have to conscript. And if you want to conscript and you don't, you know, here we conscript and then we say, if you run away, we'll shoot you. And we control the whole territory. So we'll, we, that's a credible promise. Um, if you're a small insurgency organization, people can run away and then you can't promise to shoot them very easily because you don't control all the territory. And so what these movements do is they try to brainwash you. And I think what they figured out after years of abducting children, you know, you talk about evil, um, they figured out that, you know, we have to maybe like, I don't know what the, but say like maybe one in a hundred will like buy the rhetoric. So we just have to conscript or abduct a large number of kids and then some small number of them will not run away. And those will be our committed cadres and those people can become commanders. And because they'll buy the propaganda and they'll buy the messianic messages. But but because most people wise up, 
we have to, especially as they get older, we just have to abduct vast numbers of kids in order to have a committed cadre. And so, so it has the other benefit of sort of being terrifying for the population and being a weapon in itself. But it, I think it was, for them, it was just primarily a way to solve a recruitment problem uh, when you're a, a totally, uh, like, hopeless and uh, ideologically empty rebel movement. So in some sense, it's, it's it, yeah, so it, 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 that that's maybe the short story. It was a real tragedy. I heard one interview of a dictator uh, where the journalist was basically telling them, like, how could you be doing this? Uh, basically calling out all the atrocities the person is committing and the dictator was kind of laughing it off and walked away. Yeah. And like he cut off the interview. That feel like a very unproductive thing to be doing. You're basically stating the thing that everyone knows to his face. Maybe that's pleasant to somebody, uh, but that feels unproductive. It feels like the goal should be some level of understanding. Yeah. It's not a great example of that's an, you know what the way I look at that situation is it's a little bit particular to the way Uganda works, but um, most of the political leadership for most of its post-independence history came from the north of the country. That was like the power base and, and it was dictatorial and they were, so you've heard of like people like Idi Amin, but people have heard of like Milton Abote and all these people were all from the north. Uh, and then you get the current president who came to power in 1986. So he's been around a long time. This guy Museveni, he, um, he was from the South and his, he was fighting, he was fighting against these dictators and he was fighting for a freer and better Uganda. And in many ways, I mean, he's, he's still a dictator himself, but he did create a freer and better Uganda. So he's better than these, he's a thug, but he was better than thugs before him. Um, and he came to power and he was like, and, and, and these, the, some of the Northerners were like, we want to keep up the fight. And he was like, you know what, you guys, I'm going to, I'm strong enough to continue to the North. You guys go, you want have, you want to have a crazy insurgency up there. And some kook believes he's like, uh, speaking, you know, through the, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, speaking through him and he's going to totally disrupt the North. I, I don't care. That's great. You guys just fester and fight, and that's going to totally destabilize this power. This tradition. because it was in his political interest to do so, uh, and there's no puzzle. It's 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 in some ways it's that simple and kind of tragic. There's little to understand. Yeah, it took me a lot. Well, you know what? It's not so easy. In the middle of it, I didn't understand that. I don't think a lot of people did. And and I'm not, I, I think I could persuade most people who study or work there now to like see it that way. I think people that would make sense to people, but it didn't make sense in the moment. And, you know, in the moment this is happening, it's terrible. And you kind of, you know, you don't realize how avoidable it was that basically it was the absence of effective police actions that kept the lunatic from being contained. Um, and, and that lunatic would never, you know, he's not, it's not that skillful of our movement, right? They could have, it could have been shut down and the, there was just never any political will to shut it down. The opposite. That's what I meant. Like that unchecked leader, not only do you not bear the cost, but you might have a private incentive as an autocrat to like see that violence happen. And in this case, it was, it was just keeping a troublesome. Maybe if we can return briefly at World War II from your framework. Could... There and say that. And then, and the West basically, uh, and, and then of course they were able, they, you know, because they were such a economic and political powerhouse, they were able to sort of make demands of the rest of Europe that, that, um, that you can kind of see the fold, you know, letting 
Nazis march into Denmark without a fight or France folding very quickly, you can kind of see as like an appeasement or an acknowledgement of their superiority and their ability to bargain without much of a fight. And then you can see the the Western response as a principled stand. I think that's, and there's a lot of truth to that. You know, in terms of the strategic forces, a lot of political scientists see a version of a commitment problem, basically where Germany says, you know what, we're strong now, we're temporarily strong, we're not going to be this strong forever. If we can get this terrible bargain and get everyone to capitulate, um, through violence if we strike now and then solidify our power and keep these in the, in world war one, it was prevent the rise of Russia, um, and prevent the strengthening of, 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 of Russian alliances as well. Um, and so we, so we have an incentive to strike now and there's a window of opportunity that's closing and that they thought was closing as soon as 1917 in, in World War One, And I, I don't know that that story is as persuasive in World War Two. I think there was an element of a closing window. Well, they kept talking about a closing window. Yeah. Hitler really thought there was a closing window. I think it was a nature of that window is different uh, in that there was kind of pacifism. And it seems like if... Um, war broke out most nations in the vicinity would not be ready because by the yeah, by yeah. the people the yeah. leaders that are in power that requires his ideology as well how do uh so to avoid it yeah it, within this framework would you say is there uh that's uh, you, you kind of provide an explanation, but is is there a way to avoid it? Is is violence the way to avoid it? Because people kind of tried rational yeah. uh peace peaceful kind of usual negotiation and that led to this war. Is that unique to this particular war? It, let's say World War One or World War Two. So there's an extra pressure from Germany on both wars to to act. Okay. So we've highlighted that. Is there a way to alleviate that extra pressure to act? Let me use World War I as an example. Suppose, as many German generals said at that time, we have a window of opportunity before Russia where we might not win a war with Russia. Like So the, the probability that we can win a war is going to change a lot in the next decade or two, uh, maybe even in the next few years. And so if we, we are in a much better bargaining position now, both to not use violence, but to, if, if necessarily, use violence. Because otherwise, Russia is going to be extremely powerful in the future, and they'll be able to use that power to to change the bargain with us and to like hold keep us down. And and the thing is, is in principle, Russia could say, "Look, we don't want to get invaded right now. We know you could invade us. We know we're weak. We know we'll be strong in the future. We promise to like not wield our and abuse our." Or just merely just sort of take what we can get. That's a commitment that would solve the problem. And they can't make that commitment because there's nobody who will hold them accountable. So anything, any international legal architecture, any uh, set of enforceable agreements, any UN Security Council, any world government, any anything that would help you make that commitment is a solution. The La Fusina can do that. They can say, listen, yes, combo that's strong today is going to be weak tomorrow. You have an incentive to eliminate this combo over here, but because they're going to be strong. But guess what? You're not going to do that. And we're going to make sure, we're going to promise that when these guys do get strong, we're going to restrain what they can do. I mean, most of our constitutions in most stable countries have done precisely that, right? There's a lot of complaining right now in the United States about the way that the Constitution is a portion power between states. Um, that was a deal. That was a commitment. The Constitution was a, in the United States was a, a deal made to a bunch of states that knew they were going to be weak in future because of economic and demographic trends, or guess they might be. And it said, listen, you cooperate 
and will and 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 will commit not to basically ignore your interests over the long run. And now, you know, 250 years later, we're we're still honoring those commitments. Um, it was part of the deal that that meant that there actually would be a, a union. And so we we do this all the time. So constitution is a good example of how um Every country's constitution, especially a country who's writing a constitution after a war, that constitution and all of the other institutions they're building are an attempt to like provide commitment to groups who are worried about future shifts in power. And then does that help with avoid civil war? So could you speak to uh, lessons you learned from civil wars, yeah. perhaps the American Civil War, any others? So Lebanon, one of the ways... Lebanon had tried for a long time to um, preserve the interests of minority groups, powerful minority groups who were powerful at the time and knew that the, the demographics were working against them, were to guarantee, you know, this ethnic religious group gets the presidency and this ethno religious group gets the prime ministership and this ethno and will and a lot of a lot of countries will apportion seats in the parliament to ethno-religious groups. And that's an attempt to like give a group that's temporarily powerful some assurances that they're, when they're weak in the future, that they'll still have a say, right? Just like we portion seats in the Senate in a way that's not demographically representative, but is like unequal, quote unquote, in a sense to help people be confident that there won't be a tyranny of the majority. And now that just happens to have been like a really unstable arrangement in Lebanon because eventually like the de facto power on the ground just gets so out of line with this really rigid system of the presidency goes to this ethno-religious group and this prime ministership goes that, that it didn't last, right? So, but you can think of every post-conflict agreement and every constitution is like a little bit of humans best effort to find an agreement that's going to protect the interests of a group. See reason and, uh, and, and avoid this really terrible inefficient thing, which is fighting. But well, the thing that's going on the whole time is both of you arming and spending like 20% of GDP or whatever right. on arms. That's pretty inefficient. Yes. That's the tragedy. We don't have war and that's good, but we have really limited abilities to like incentivize our enemies not to arm and to keep ourselves from arming. We'd love to agree to just like both disarm, but we can't. And so the, the mess is that we have to arm and then we have to threaten all the time. Yeah. yeah. So the threat of violence is costly nevertheless. You've actually pulled up uh, that now disappeared a paper that said, the big title called Civil War, and your name is on uh, it. Uh, what's that about? Well, that was, I mean, when I was finishing graduate school, and this was a paper with my advisor at Ted Miguel at Berkeley. Um, Most nations, the paper opens, have experienced an internal armed conflict since 1960. Yet while they, were you still in grad school on this or no? Last, maybe last year or just, just graduated, I yeah. think. I wish I was in a discipline that rope. Um, and I, like a number of people around that time, stumbled into violence. I mean, people have been studying the wealth and poverty of nations basically since the invention of economics. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a big blind spot for violence. Now there isn't any more, it's like a flourishing area of study, but in economics, but at the time it wasn't. And so there were people like me and Ted who were sort of part political scientists, because political scientists obviously had been studying this for a long time, who started bringing economic tools and expertise and like partnerships with political scientists and, and adding to it. And so we wrote this so after like people have been doing this for five or 10 years in our field, we wrote like a review article 
telling economists like what was going on. And so this was like a summary for economists. So the book in some ways is a lot in the same spirit of this mm -hmm. article. This article, I mean, it's it's designed to be not written as like a boring laundry list of studies, which is what, the, that's that's the purpose this article was served. It's, it was for graduate students and professors who wanted to think about what to work on and what we knew. Um, this book is like now trying to like, not just say what economists are doing, but sort of say what economists, political scientists, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, like once, what's, how do we bring some sense to this big project and policymakers? Like, what do we know? And what do we know about building peace? Given, you know, because if you don't know what the reason for wars are, you're probably not going to design the right cure. Um, and so, so anyway, so that was the, but, but I started off studying civil wars and, and I, because I stumbled into this place in Northern Uganda, basically by accident, it was a I'd never, no intention of working in civil wars. I'd never thought about it. And, and then, you know, uh, basically, basically I, I followed a woman there. And most fighting, which is what I do on my own time. <laughs> and then we could discuss, analyze, maybe with George St. Pierre. That's what all he sends me uh, for people who are curious. Uh, but let me ask you, one of the most difficult things going on in the world today, Israel, Palestine. Will we ever see peace in this part of the world? And sort of your book title, is the roots of war and the path for peace, or yeah. the subtitle, Why We Fight. Um, what's the path for peace? Will we ever see peace? Yeah. If we think about this uh, uh, conflict in the sense of like this dispute, this sort of contest, this contest that's been going on between Israelis and Palestinians, it's been going on for a century. And there, there were really just, 10 or 15 years of pretty serious violence in that span of time. Most of it from 2000 to 2009 and stretching up to like 2014. They're like... But this is a good example of two rivals who most of the time have avoided really intense violence. So the <laughs> you talked about this like most of the time. Yeah. Rivals just like avoiding violence and hating each other in peace. So this, is this what peace, so to answer my question. Yeah, is, sometimes, is, I mean. Is this what peace looks like? Not always, but I mean, it's it's what, it's what kind of my worry to go back to like the Russia-Ukraine example. Like I kind of, it's really hard, it's going to be really hard to find an, a, an agreement that both sides can feel they can honor, that they can be explicit about, that they'll hold to, that will enable them to move on. Yes. Yeah. The war for 30 years, that would be a sad, but maybe possible outcome. Um, so that's kind of where Israel-Palestine looks to me. And so someone, if we're going to talk about why we fight, then the question we have to ask is like, why? You know, like the second intifada, like that was the most violent episode. Like, why did that happen, and why did that, and, and why did that last several years? That would be like we could uh, analyze that, and we could say what was it about these periods of violence that led there to be prolonged, intense violence? Because that was in nobody's interest. That didn't need to happen. And part I don't talk about that in the book. You know, I wanted to avoid really contemporary conflicts for two reasons. One is I things could change really quickly. I didn't want the book to be dated. I wanted this to be a book that had like longevity and that that would be relevant still in 10 years or 20 years maybe before someone writes a better one uh, or an or update. Before the human civilization ends. <laughs> exactly. And circumstances can change really quickly. So I wanted it to be enduring and meant partly just avoiding changing things and changing these and, and avoiding these controversial ones. But I, of course, I think about them. And so like a lot of my time... I decided actually last year to teach a class where I'd take all these con contemporary conflicts I wasn't working on the book and where I wasn't really an expert, whether it's India, Pakistan, China, Taiwan, Israel, Palestine, Mexican cartel, state drug wars, um, and a few others, and then teach a class on them with students. And we'd work through it. We'd read the book and then we'd say, all right, none of us are experts. How do we make sense of these places? 
and we focused in the Israel-Palestine case of mostly trying to understand why it got so violent mm -hmm. and spend a little bit of time on what the prospects are for something that's more enduring. It's hard to know that stuff yeah. now. I mean, it's, yeah. it's easier to do the full analysis when, when it's over, looking too. back when it's over. Well, Israel is in like a tough place. They have this attachment to being part of the West. They have this attachment to liberal ideals. They have an attachment to democracy. And they have an attachment to a Jewish state. And that those things are not so easily compatible. Because to recognize the rights of non-Jewish citizens, right, or to or to create or to have a one state solution to the current conflict undermines the long term ability to have a Jewish state. Um and to do anything else and to deny that denies their liberal democratic ideals. And and that's a really hard contest of priorities for to sort out. Yeah, it's complicated. Of course, everything you just said probably has multiple perspectives on it from other people yeah. that would phrase all the same things but using different words. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to I try to analyze these things in like a dispassionate way. But that, unfortunately, just having been yeah, enough yeah. conversations, even your dispassionate description would be seen as a as a as one that's already picked aside. And I'll I'll say this because there's holding these ideals. I'll I'll give you another example. United States also has ideals of freedom and and other like human rights. Uh, so it has those ideals, and yet it also sees itself as a superpower and as a deployer of those enforcer of those ideas in the world. And so the kind of actions from a perspective of a lot of people in that world, from children, they get to see drones drop bombs on yeah. their house where, the, where their father is now mother or dead. Uh, they have a very different view yeah. of this. Uh, well, you're beginning to see why I didn't. I decided I wanted to. I I wanted to write about those things and think about those things, but I wanted this. I but I wanted this book to do something different. And right. not, I didn't want it to fall along one of these polarizations. My, you know, in a, on a personal level, because I think I'm kind of a liberal democratic person at heart, my sympathies in that sense lie in many ways with the Palestinians, despite the way I, I mean, I, I'm I, just the, the fact that people are, they're not represented and, and they, you know, uh, and they got a very raw, real politic kind of deal. Like most people in history have gotten like this raw Real politic kind of deal in their past, right? Where somebody it's a took good something. Summary of history, by the way. <laughs> it's, that's it. It's history is just full of raw deals <laughs> for regular people, right? And uh, and both sides are, in a principled way, refusing to make a compromise. And and I'm not, that's not like a both sides are right kind of argument. I'm just sort of saying on a. I just think it's a factual statement that like. Neither one wants to compromise on certain principles and, and they're both, they both can construct and, and in some ways have very reasonable, I don't want to have, have self justifications for those principles. And that's why I'm not very hopeful is I'm, I don't see a way and to, for them to resolve those things. Speaking of compromise and war, let me ask you about one last one, which may be in the And one of them is increasing interdependence and interrelationships. And another one is more checks and balances on power. I think there's more, but those are two that are really fundamental here because I think those two things reduce the incentives for war in two ways. One is like, right now, remember when we were talking about this really simple strategic game where uh, whether I'm Russia and Ukraine or, or whatever, any two rivals, I want more of the pie than you get and, and, and in that simple game. Now, in reality, uh, many groups do care about the well-being of the other group, at least a little bit, right? We're, you know, in some sense, to the degree we, first of all, if our interests are intertwined, like our economies are intertwined, um, that, that's not a surefire 
way for peace and we shouldn't get complacent because we have a globally integrated world, but that's going to be a disincentive. And if we're socially entwined because we have great social relationships and linkages and family or we're intermarriage or whatever, this is all these things will 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 help. And then if we're ideologically intertwined, maybe we share a notions of liberty, or maybe we just share a common notion of humanity. So I think the fact that we're more integrated than we've ever been on all three fronts in the world, but with China is is providing some insulation, which is good. So I would be more worried if we started to shed some of that insulation, which I think has been happening a little bit. U.S. economic nationalism, um, whatever could be the fallout of these sanctions or a closer Chinese alliance with Russia, all those things could happen. Those would make me more worried because I think we've got a lot of cushion that comes from all of this economic, social, cultural interdependence. That yeah, the social one with the internet is, is a big one. So basically, make friends with the people from different nations. Yeah. Fall in love. Or you don't have to fall in love. You can just have lots of sex with people from different <laughs> nations. But also fall in love. The thing that also should comforts me about China is that they, China's not as centralized or as personalized a regime as Russia, for example. And neither one of them is as centralized or personalized as like a... Um, the... The attempts by Xi Jinping to personalize power over time and to make China a more centralized and personal ruled place, which is, is he's successfully moved in that direction also worries me. So anything, anything that moves China in the other direction, not necessarily being democratic, but just like a wider and wider group of people holding power, like the, all of the business leaders and all the things that have been happening over the last few centuries have actually like widened power. But anything that's moving in the other direction does worry me because it's going to accentuate all these five risks. I am worried about the, a little bit of the demonization. So yeah. one of the things I <clears throat> see with China as a problem for Americans, uh, for, maybe I'm projecting, maybe it's just my own problem, but you know there seems to be a bigger cultural gap than there is with other superpowers throughout history where it's like it's almost like this own world happening in China, its own world in the United States, and there's this gap of total cultural understanding. Like we're, it's not that, um, that like we're not competing superpowers. They're almost like doing their own thing. There's that that feeling, and I think that means there's a lack of understanding of culture of people, and we need to kind of bridge that understanding. I mean, you know, the language barrier, but also cultural understanding, making movies that's, uh, that you, you use both and explore both cultures and all that kind of stuff. To where, like, it's okay to compete. You know, like Rocky, where um, uh, <laughs> Rocky Balboa fought the Russian. Uh, in fact, you know, historically inaccurate because obviously the Russian would win. But, you know, we have to, I'm just kidding. As a Philly person, I was, of course, rooting for Rocky. But the the thing is, those two superpowers are in the movies. China is like its own out there thing. We need more Rock, Rocky 7. I do think there's a certain inscrutability to the politics there and an insularity to the politics such that it's harder for Westerners, even if they know, even just to learn about it and understand what's going on. That I think that's a problem and vice versa. Um, so I think that's true. But I at the, but you, you, at the same time, we could point to all sorts of things on the other side of the ledger, like the massive amounts of Chinese immigration into the United States and the massive number of people who are now like how many, so many more Americans, business people, politicians understand so much more about China now yeah. than they did 30, 40 years ago because we're so intertwined. So, so I don't know where, where it balances out. I think it balances out on better understanding than ever before, but you're right. There was like a big gulf there that we haven't totally bridged. No, uh, and love and marriage and all that kind of social social cohesion. So once again, returning to love, uh, I read in your acknowledgement, and as you mentioned earlier, the acknowledgement reads, quote, I dedicate this book to a slow and now defunct internet cafe in Nairobi, 
because it set me on the path to meet, work with, and most importantly, marry Jenny Annan. Jeannie Annan. Jeannie, Jeannie Annan. There's a lot, of, a lot of beautiful letters in this beautiful name. This book have been impossible without her and that chance encounter. What's, uh, okay, tell me, <laughs> Uh, tell me, Chris, how you fell in love and how that changed the direction of your life. I... To the, the the sort of the big internet cables until maybe 10 years later. And so it was just glacially slow. So it would take 10 minutes for every email to load. And so it, there's this whole customer norm of you just chat to the next person in, in beside you all the time. It was, it was true all over anywhere I'd worked on the continent. And, um, and I, so I strategically sat next to the attractive looking woman that when I came in and, um, uh, and I think she talked to me in spite of the fact that I was wearing a suit, maybe because I knew a little bit about the war, which most people didn't, most people were totally ignorant. And then we, we had a fling for that week. And then we didn't really, we actually, then we met up a little short while later. And then it was kind of, then we kind of drifted apart. She was studying in Indiana and spending a lot of time in um, Uganda. And and then one day uh, I was chatting with uh, someone I knew who worked on this, young professor who was a friend of mine, but, and I said, oh, you know, you work on similar Fascinating research question and i thought to my, and i walked out of the building and i thought that is a fascinating research question and i phoned Jeannie and i uh and i said remember me and you know tell me more i was just talking to someone about this tell me more like i i started asking her more questions about it. we ended up talking for two or three hours mm -hmm. and over the course of those three hours we hatched a very ambitious kind of <laughs> like some variation and exposure to violence and where the rebel group was to actually like show what happens to people when they're exposed to violence and conscription. We were going to like tell, you know, psychologically, economically, we were going to like answer questions and that, which would help you design better programs. Right. And so we hatched this plan, which is totally cockamamie. Yeah. It's so cockamamie that when I pulled my previous dissertation proposal from my committee, like the next week and gave them a new one, they unanimously met without me to decide that this was totally bonkers uh, and to advise me not to go. And they coordinated to read my old proposal so that when I showed up for my defense, they said, you actually think you're defending, but we're actually, we want you to only talk about this other thing you were going to do because this is like, you should not go. Oh, wow. And I mean, the, it is incredibly ambitious. Super interesting, though. It actually worked exactly according to plan. It's the first and last time in my entire career. <laughs> you actually pulled off an ambition, like a gigantically crazy ambition. Well, idea. all of my work, that's my <laughs> shtick. Like, my day-to-day -day research job is not writing books about why we fight. My thing is, like, I go, I collect data on things that nobody else thought you could collect data on. And so I always do pull it off, but it never turns out like I thought it was going to. Like it's always, there's so many twists and turns and it always goes sideways in an interesting way and it works, but it's all, but this one actually we pulled off. Like, well, this, and I think at the end of the movie, they're sort of like, this will never work because these relationships in intense circumstances never matter, which is what we assumed. Mm -hmm. And that turned out not to be true. So we've been married <laughs> 15 years and we have two kids. And Yeah. And that's when you fell in love with psychology and learned to appreciate the power of psychology. Exactly. That's, so that's the psychology in the book as well. Because I, and so we ended up, we, for most of our work for the first five or 10 years was together, actually. What's the hardest piece of data that you've been chasing that you've chased in your life like what are some interesting things because you mentioned like one of the things you you kind of want to go somewhere in the world and find evidence and data for things that people just haven't really looked to get gain an understanding of human nature maybe from an economics perspective what's uh what what a, what kind of stuff either in your past or in your future you've been thinking about well i mean the hardest there's hard in two cents. The hardest emotionally was interviewing all those kids in Northern Uganda. That was just like a gut punch every day. 
um and just hearing the stories like that was the hardest but it wasn't hard because it was you could the kids were everywhere and everybody would talk to you about it and they could talk about it you could, you could. no one had gone and interviewed kids that had gone through war in the middle of an active war zone nobody was going to displace all the things we did no one had done that before so and now lots of people do it could you actually speak to their their stories what what's like the shape of their suffering what what were common themes what how did that those stories change you i remember i said you could you have like your dispassionate self and your passion itself i think i had to learn to create the dispassion itself i mean we all have that capacity when we analyze something that's far away and happens to people different than us but you have to i think i discovered and developed an ability to like put those aside in order to be able to study this so um you get maybe harder in a way that you have to be guard against so you have to try to remember to put your human hat on it's really horrible. Like if I want to conscript you and I don't want you to run away, then I want to make you think you can never go back to your village. And the best way for me to do that is for to make you, force you to do something really, really, really. That you'd be sitting there in an interview with somebody and they'd be telling you the story and it's like the most horrible thing that could happen to you or anyone else. And, and, but there's some voice in the back of your mind saying, okay, we really need to get to the other thing. You know, we know that I know how this goes. Like I've heard, you know, there's this thing like, okay, okay. I, I'm not learning anything yeah. new here. Like there's some part, you know, deep, <laughs> evil, terrible part of you. That's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but let's get on to the other thing. But I know I have to go through this. But every day you have to go through that to get to the, cause you're trying to actually understand how to help people. You're trying to understand how that trauma has manifested, how they either, some people get stronger as a result of that. Some people get weaker. And if you want to know how to help people, then you need to get to that. I wasn't trying to get to something for my selfish purposes, really. I was trying to figure out, okay, we need to know what your symptoms are now. That's such a dark yeah. thing about us. So if you're surrounded by trauma, God, that voice so in routine. the back of your head that you just go, yeah, I, I know exactly how this conversation goes. Let's skip ahead to the to the solutions, to the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so but, that was, <laughs> that was, yeah. So that was because you then have to deal with yourself. So it's very helpful if you like come home every night to someone who's A, gone through the same thing and B, is a professional and very, 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 very good counseling psychologist. Um, the... The hardest thing, I mean, this, the, the organized in a way that's safe for me and safe for my team and safe for people to answer a survey. Like, how do you get, how do you get the information on what gangs are doing in the community or how it's hurting or helping people? Like you've got to run surveys and you've got to talk to gang members, all these things. And that nobody knows how to do that. Yeah. And so we had to sort of really slowly, not nobody, there's a few other, I think there's other academics like me who are doing this, but there's a, it's a pretty small group that's trying to like collect systematic data. And then there's a slightly bigger and much more experienced group that's been talking to different armed groups. But every time you go to a new city and there weren't that many people working on this in Medellin, there were a few, you have to like discover a new, like it's, it's really going to be unique to that. <laughs> things of this nature so they they do have public profiles a little bit but not not expl not so explicitly no so they're clandestine here's an example so one of the things that's really endemic in medellin it's true in a lot of cities it's true in american prisons is gangs govern everybody's everyday life so if you have a in an american prison particularly in illinois or california texas is another big one but also in a city in medellin if you have a problem um a debt to collect or dispute with a neighbor or something, you could go to the government and, and they do and you, they can help you solve it. Or you can go to the police or you can go to the gang. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's like a really everyday phenomenon. But then, then there's a question. This is the Lex Free Podcast.